Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. Vast is the road of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, where in the universal teaching I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the road of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, where in the universal teaching I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Vast is the robe of liberation, a formless field of benefaction, where in the universal teaching I realize the one true nature, thus harmonizing all being. Thank you. So, welcome. It's good to see everybody. Yeah, you too. Yeah. So, um, catch me up on how far you all got, where different people are, what we need to go over. Trudy, you're, are you done with your frame? Um. Frame done. Started doing the um, the middle line. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And it, and it looks like that on the back. Okay. Let me look. So is it coming all the way through? Yeah, coming all the way through and making a sort of slightly broken line on the back. Right. Right. Okay. So you've got. The first line around the inner part of the frame done. Yeah, all done. Back and front. Right. And, and then the, that that line that's halfway along. Right. That's what you're working on. Yeah. The middle section of the frame, and then you'll yeah. do the outer section of the frame. Yes. Yeah, so it's it's just right on the edge, isn't it? Right. Exactly. Yeah. Just. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any questions? Any bothers? The um, line that I'm sewing at the moment isn't isn't quite halfway because it's somehow it's got a little fatter on one side than another. Um, so I've sort of generously found a middle way. <laughs> I'm hoping, and uh, and it does join up on the corners. So I thought as long as that looked rectangular. That would be okay. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Maria, how are you doing? Where do you have you? <clears throat> well, I'm I'm up to I'm still on the panels and I'm just sewing my fifth one. Okay, so you're attaching yeah, uh, just... A to four A B. Okay, great. Yeah, four to five, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm just attaching those. Just got to score that that line and finish that off before I start on what Trudy's doing. <laughs> Looks so complicated. It's got a few anxieties about moving to the next stage, but I'm sure step by step. 
Um, You'll be all right. Lynn, where have you found yourself? Um, I've uh, cut out my frame. Okay. And uh, measured. Uh, I don't know whether I can show show it. It's rather long to show. <laughs> I don't know whether you can see it. Uh, uh, measured it and cut it out and uh, marked it. Okay. Um, I did do uh, last time. A sort of mock-up frame for myself kind of because I didn't trust my measuring <laughs> so uh, so um, I'm hoping that this one will, will work so I haven't started to put it together mm -hmm. I haven't started the pin yet yeah okay great um, I did have a question about because when I spoke to John about it he said that you mark with the hearer on the opposite side which I haven't done you don't work on the opposite side. You can work on the same side, just over. Just run the hair over. Oh, right. Okay. Uh, and it'll show on both sides. Because um, he, he said you could, you could mark it but, and then use the hair. So, okay. So, I'm, I'm using the hair on the same side. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or the opposite side. It seems to me it's a little easier to use the hair on the same side. Yes. Well, I was thinking, how do I how do I do it on the opposite side? <laughs> well, it's hard enough measuring it. But uh, yeah. Okay. So that's where I'm up to. Hey. Thank Mara, you. How's it going? It's it's going really well, actually. I am struggling in a joyful way with the voice of my stitch, and I'm engaged in some really in depth self psychoanalyst analysis. Um, as I go through my precepts class, there's a certain amount of imposter um, syndrome going on because, <laughs> you know, I'm selling a Rakusu when I don't quite feel like I've earned the privilege to do that. So there's just all kinds of stuff going on. And all of it is really wonderful. And being here on Sundays, and observing with great diligence what you all are doing and knowing that I don't have to memorize every bit of it because of the videos is so great and reassuring to me. And I'm grateful to all of you for your patience with me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, that's great, good. Well, I'm glad you're, you're um... Like you said, working with the voice of your stitch, that's a very beautiful image. Thank you. So Rosemarie, how's it going? Okay, so I'm um, basically doing two different things. One is um, four and five, I'm putting four and five together. And then I am um, attaching um, one and two to three. So I got two lines going. Yeah. Okay. Great. So I have enough to keep me going. I probably have some questions at the end. Okay. Yeah. You're almost finished with the face. Yeah. So Claire, how's it going? Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, I've pinned one to two and four to five. So I'll sew those two lines today. Okay. Great. Good. And Alan, Alan, yeah. I, I got my face attached, uh, you know, all the pieces attached, and then I've basted that to the interface, and I need to, and the silk's been pinned 
to the back and I need to baste the silk. Onto the inner That's area. my next thing to baste the silk. And then I guess I'll be looking at the frame. Is that what's next? Right. Oh, sure. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, and I've got, I've got a frame that's just a piece of fabric that's rough cut that I can show you how to measure if anybody's interested in that to actually measure out and, and mark the fabric for the frame. And then I've got a frame that's already cut and marked that I can show you. Great, thank you. Hopefully that's that's some help for people. I have to tell you guys a story. I was working on Trudy's lay teacher, um, Rakasu, yesterday. And I'm a little further along. I've done the straps and I'm uh, attaching the neck piece to the straps. Hmm. And um, I read the instructions and I thought I knew what I was doing and it didn't work. <laughs> it didn't work. I turned, I did this, the weird origami thing where you turn it inside out and it wasn't right. And so I thought of you all and I took it all apart and I didn't look at the instructions again because I figured, okay, now I figured out what I did wrong. I'm going to go ahead and do this right. So I put it together again. And at least this time I just basted it. I didn't actually sew it all the way. And I did the little origami trick where you turn it inside out and it was still wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I sat down and I read the instructions again and it was right there. It was right there in the instructions. I mean, it was, it wasn't, I mean, I knew what it was now, but it wasn't totally clear, obviously to me in the beginning, but it was so funny. It was just such a, it was such a, and thing to think i know what i'm doing and not only do i know what i'm doing i know better than the instructions the instructions are wrong after you know these instructions that have been published and printed well they're wrong and i'm going to do it this other way okay. I, I, you you have my brain doing your my rakasu thank you <laughs> Perfect pairing. <laughs> Perfect pairing. I'm channeling you. I'm Thank channeling. you so much. <laughs> oh. And I was just going to say if anybody would like to take photographs of where you're up to um, and send them to me on Maria Moo or WhatsApp and I can in incorporate them into the video, they just might be useful to have different stages yeah. that, you, that you're up to for you to have visuals. I'll just put them in as we go along thank you maria good idea yeah. maria i would appreciate that so much because it might be a year from now but i really need them <laughs> <laughs> yeah. i'd just like to make a call out um to maria because she started putting timestamps on the videos and that's a lot of work and it is so incredibly helpful and such a gift and thank you i'm just so glad it's helpful makes it worth it that's really nice yeah <laughs> i'm gonna go ahead and i'm gonna run back and get uh, a rakasu that's already completed but this is the it's weird this is the fabric it's long, it's a long piece of fabric. And I think you guys all have that in your kit, but this is for the frame. The um, measurements for the frame depend on each individual's measurements for the face. So you can see in your um, instructions, if you've got those, there's something called a frame worksheet that draw, has drawn out the frame and 
the dimensions are left blank because some of the dimensions are left blank because it depends on your the size of your face. So um, I don't know. I'm gonna go get a rakasu and then get my instructions out so I can show you. Okay, great. Thank you, Maria. So this is the frame worksheet. Okay, um, so you can see that I've added in pencil along the top the length of the side for my face was 15.2 centimeters. Then the length of the bottom of the face was 23.7. The length of the side, 15.2, and again, the length of the top was 23.7. So you may measure these on your face, and you're wanting to measure approximately at the chalk line, at the line that's the seam allowance, the outer chalk line on your face. If you're face is like mine, those are not lined up perfectly. So the pieces of the face kind of end at different points, not, not wildly, not by inches, but certainly by millimeter. Um, could, you, could you repeat that, Anne? Yeah, yeah. Um, I wish I had a face to show you, but I don't. Um, but I'll show you this. So. Lynn was just holding a face up, if that's going to be helpful. Oh, yeah. Yeah, if you can. I don't know whether you can see it. Yep. Oh, now look at yours. Yours is perfect. <laughs> How did that happen? I don't know if it's the right way out, is it? Totally. <laughs> Totally perfect. Yeah, you can see, yeah, you can see that the, um, her face pieces are all the same length. Um, the A and B, the one, two, three, four, five, are all exactly the same size lengthwise. And that's amazing. Mine were not. Mine had kind of a little jagged edge along the top and along the bottom. And basically, you're just wanting to measure, you know, find where the face is complete. You're not going to measure up beyond the the edges of the face. Um, but that will make sense when you get there. I think. You know what? We're we're kind of I've realized just now that I'm jumping ahead that we still haven't talked about the interfacing on the face and the silk on the face and getting those on. So that's actually the next step for folks that are still working, that are working on the face. Because when you complete the face, then you'll attach the face to the interfacing and attach the silk to the interfacing. So let me get those instructions out before we jump ahead and um, do the frame. Or if anybody has any particular questions or preferences about, you know, what we move to next, I personally would go just step by step and take a step back from what I just presented and do the interfacing in the 
silk, but you guys can tell me if you'd like to do something different. I would appreciate the interfacing and silk and because that's, yeah. you know. That's your next step, yeah. So this is the page, which is page six, in the instructions for joining the face, the interfacing, and the lining. So the first thing I would do is go back to the very beginning of the instructions where it talks about the dimensions of the interfacing and the silk. But are they backwards? No. Okay, they're not backwards for you. Good. How does that work? That's weird. Okay. Um, so you see this is page two, the materials needed interfacing fabric. Um, for the Rakasu face, you cut one piece that's 35 by 24 and a half centimeters. So that's your largest piece. I believe that I cut those to measure. I'm not sure, but so that would be the first thing you can do when you get ready to attach the face, the, the finished face to the interfacing. It's just measure and make sure you've got a proper size. So I will say that um, that's not a deal breaker. If it's not the same size, like we we talked about in a past session, that I had measured and cut the silk incorrectly for a lot of people, but it's worked, and it's a big enough piece of silk still that it fits inside the frame, and it does what it's supposed to do, even though. I didn't do it properly, which is a lovely thing. So the the other, I would say, come down to next, come down to number three, where it says the lining, which is the calligraphy piece, which is white silk taffeta. That it says cut one piece, thirty-four by twenty-four. There's a little note here that says you should iron it first before you actually measure it and cut it. But again, I believe that they've been cut to size. So I don't think you're going to have to cut anything out. The pieces you have of the silk taffeta, the white silk taffeta, have been starched. So you don't need to starch them. The reason for the starch, my understanding, and what it says here is that it helps when they're inking it so the ink doesn't run and spread, bleed over. But they've all been sprayed with starch. Ann, excuse me, Ann. Um, mm -hmm. It does, uh, like um, a little corner of mine got bent over. The ironing won't do anything to the starch or to the iron, will it? No, it won't. It won't. Okay. Yeah, you can set it on silk. Be careful if you decide to iron or you need to iron the interfacing, which you probably will need to do just to get any um, folds out. Iron it with a low temperature iron because a lot of interfacing is, uh, will melt with a high, higher temperature. So just be aware of that. There's another sentence on number two on this page that talking about the interfacing fabric and it says wash in hot water to shrink iron before using. You don't need to worry about that. It's, it was washed.
Anne. Uh huh. Uh, okay, I'm measuring my silk piece, and it is not that big. Yes. Yes, that's what we people have discovered that I measured and cut them wrong. Okay. How big? How big is your piece of silk? Okay, it's about. Looks like it's about thirty by maybe thirty-two. And, um, and then the, the shorter side looks like it's a almost 20. Okay. I mean, I believe that that was the problem that other people had, that, that I measured, mismeasured and miscut the silk. Okay. But the silk will work. Okay. Because it's going to be stuck inside of the frame. Okay. So you're going to have a lot of overhang. Okay. Anyway, when you when you lay the interfacing down, uh -huh. flat flat in front of you, and then you take your face and lay it flat on top of the interfacing. So with the stitching, the namukiebutsu side facing up. then your face should fit on the silk and the interfacing with some overhang. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. So I apologize for All right. I, just, I don't who, who knows how that happened. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and attention. I'd just like to say, Anne, I really appreciate all the measuring, having tried to measure this frame, all of the measuring that you've done so accurately, you know, and, and, and sometimes not quite, but brilliantly. Right. So just thank, <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Yeah. So that going back to page six, joining the face interfacing and lining. So you basically when your face is done, I would recommend you iron it. So you try to get it as flat as possible. Um, and then you just lie the interfacing, the piece of interfacing down in front of you on the table. And then lay the face right in the middle, approximately in the middle. You don't need to measure, you know, how much overlap do I have on the right side and how much overlap do I have on the left. You certainly can do that if you want to make very sure that you get it as centered as you can. You can make the overlap on both sides equal and on the top and the bottom edge equal. But basically you just want some overhang and you'd like it to be the same size all the way around. So then you're going to place one pin right in the center of the face and you're going to go all the way through the face, all the way through the interfacing and then come back out through the face. So you're just fixing the face to the interfacing uh, right at the center. I'm sorry, Anne, can you uh, repeat that whole thing of the pinning? Yeah, yeah. So you've got the interfacing, the rectangle of interfacing down on the table in front of you. And you put the face down on top of the interfacing with the right side of the face facing up. Does that make sense to everybody to know what the right side is? Yeah. Um, uh, um, and the, um, there's a little um, uh, note on, on here that says fin face interfacing. Is that the right side up? The, the interfacing doesn't have either right or oh. wrong side. Oh, okay. So sometimes you could buy interfacing that does, but this doesn't. Okay. 
So either side of the interfacing. So you get the face and you set it down exactly in the center of the piece of interfacing. I was saying that you can measure the top edges and the bottom edge and make those adjust the face on the interfacing to make those measurements equal. So the overlap on the top edge and the overlap on the bottom edge should be the same dimension. And then do the same, you can do the same on the sides, the right side and the left side. The overhang on the right side and the overhang on the left side should be, should measure equally. And that will help you get it exactly centered. But I will tell you that the edges, the overhang of this interfacing and the edges of your face are going to be inside the frame. So it's not important to be exact down to the millimeter because they'll be covered up. After you get the face centered on the interfacing, the instruction says you place one pin in exactly in the middle. So you go through the interfacing, or you go through the face, through the interfacing, back up through the interfacing, and through the face. So you've pinned exactly the center of the facing to exactly the center of the interfacing. And then you pin at the edges. You're gonna, you're gonna pin all the way around the edges. And they instruct you to do that in pairs of opposites. So you can start on the, put a pin on the upper right hand corner and then on the bottom left hand corner. And then the opposite of that and then fill in so you're you're putting pins all the way around you're pinning the face to the interfacing all the way around and the pins are going to be about two inches apart all the way around and then you're going to thread the needle with the matching thread so the the dark blue thread that's different than the thread you've used to do the Namu Kiyobutsu stitch. And you're just going to sew the face to the interfacing. And you're going to sew on, well, you're going to sew right about half a centimeter outside of the chalk line that's running along the entire outer edge of your frame, of your face, I'm sorry, your face. What if you've accidentally used the matching thread for the face of you? Does that matter? It, it, yeah. I. <laughs> I remember this. It's, it's fine. It's fine. So your matching thread and your your contrasting thread are the same thread, and that that's totally fine. Okay, so yeah. I can choose, do I use the other thread for all this rest? No, I use I use your regular thread. You're going to have plenty of thread. Right. So I would use. They're telling you to use the matching thread. I'm not really sure why they want you to keep changing uh, because you won't see these stitches. Um, I think, I, I don't know why, but 
the instructions say attach the face to the to the interfacing with the matching thread so but it won't matter at all that you're using that color for your namu kiyobutsu stitch also yeah yeah great <laughs> thank you <laughs> so you're gonna sew with small running stitches so small running stitches are just regular what we think of as sewing just go down and come up and go down and come up just um and i would say keep them pretty small you don't it's just not you want it to stay attached. You don't want it to wiggle around. So it doesn't need to be tiny, but it doesn't need to be stitches an inch long. That's a little big. So is it clear to folks where you're gonna sew that right outside, about half a centimeter outside that edge, that seam edge outside of that chalk mark on the face. Yeah, that sounds clear to me. Uh, not good. Not, not to me. I'm sorry. Hey, so, El Ellen, is, is are it, you? Go ahead. Sorry. Is, is it just uh, to check my understanding and in case this makes sense to Rosemary, is it halfway between the outermost seam allowance and the end of the fabric yes oh right. that will work so, so um that's, i don't know whether that's... you can see mine okay. yeah let's see I, can, uh, wait, wait a second. I don't know whether you can see mine oh, one... oh let's see so 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 it's so it's here is the seam is what we're saying right, right. That... So, but so so she's got so lynn has got her silk sewed to her interfacing and those are the little stitches you see up in the white fabric oh, oh okay okay that's that okay but oh, what you uh, yeah uh, but the interfacing was sewed here wasn't it i yeah. see yeah. because it's the same color as the fabric it's hard to see but i it's do a, see it. yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah thank you yeah. thank you lynn yeah okay. yeah i got it now okay yes Cool. Great. Yeah, so you can go ahead and use knots. This is not one of the, the lines of sewing where you don't use knots. You can go ahead and, you know, start out. You don't need to use a piece of thread that is long enough to finish the whole thing. That's always a little um, tricky to sew with if you have a really long piece of thread. I mean, you can knot it in the middle of the line of stitching and add a new piece of thread, all of this sewing is gonna be covered up inside the frame. So the knots are unimportant. Feel like I need to hurry and get to this point because oh, by this no. time already I'm going to forget it. No, no, it's no. all here. We'll be back next. You'll be taking off for a couple of weeks, yeah, but I'll yeah, be here for two weeks. So it'll be all on the video, Rosemary. Yeah, thank yeah. you. Yeah, so appreciate it, Maria, and I I depend on it and I use it. Yeah. That's great. And and for future sewers, this whole curriculum, you know, is going to be there, you know? Yeah. So I think that's probably enough um, going forward. Ellen, is this making sense to you or are you? yeah thank you it makes sense okay great yeah and this is a nice easy line of sewing just because it's a running stitch yeah. 
When you have a moment, can I ask a question about the bottom line of sewing? Yes, the outer line. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so do you, so if I've drawn, I've just chalked it up a little. And I imagine that you take it as though it, it's not right on the edge, but just leaves a little um, tiny line along it. Yes. Yes. Let's see if I can show you what this one looks oh, like. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's great. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you. just a tiny little bit. Yeah. And would the recommendation be to sew it with as long a piece of thread as you can so you haven't got, because I'm not using knots, I'm sort of sewing over where I start again. Exactly. Yeah. As long a piece of thread as you can reasonably manage. Uh, and sometimes you can just get it so that you it's long enough to get to the corners. Yeah. And then you can kind of hide. Yeah, I've been sort of weaving, weaving a, a piece through and coming out further away and cutting it there. So it's exactly. kind of hidden, hidden inside. Yeah. what do you mean by not using knots so the stitching that trudy is doing which is when you get the frame and you put the face connected to the interfacing and connected to the silk inside the frame there's a very tricky bit of sewing because you're gonna um you have to connect just the well you'll see when you get to it but it, it has to do with not going through all three or four layers of fabric you're having to learn just through your fingers and your hand how far you're going through the fabric but what she's talking about is this this line that there's three lines of stitching mm. on the frame and with those stitches, that's a namukie butsu stitch. And you don't use knots. Mm. You just use sewing back over. See if I can find where I've sewn back over. So you're sort of hiding. Let's see. I mean, I'm going to find the piece of the page on the instructions that talks about that. So in the frame. Page eight, I think. Thank you. I did so. Yeah. Yeah, I had to redo one of the lines because I did so through. So I had to, I didn't think I had till I got to the end, but then I realized I'd caught the silk. Yeah. I had to take the whole line out and start again. Yeah, that's a, that's a real. Now this says, let's see, I'm coming down to the last paragraph. It says pin the back of the frame. Sew along the edge, making sure the stitches do not go through the knot should be invisible. So that's on the inner line of stitching. Yeah. So you can use knots on this inner line of stitching. The one that's closest is to the face. But when you get down here for the middle and the outer lines of stitching, it says do not use knots at all. Secure thread by overlapping three stitches at the end of a piece of thread with the first stitches on the new piece. So that inner that inner line of stitching that first line of stitching, you can use knots. 
and you can see that you're going to put the little squares on each corner. Mm -hmm. So that's a place where you can hide your knot. If you have a knot, you know, you're going to place that square and sew that square on after the frame is all put together. Right, that's handy, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, really. Maybe that's why they did that. I don't know. <laughs> I was going to ask what the little four squares are. Did they? Yeah. What's that about? How does that fit into the idea mm -hmm. of a rice patty? I don't know. Well, it's um, it's actually explained in the Buddha's robe is sewn. Oh, what did they say, Marla? I can't remember. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I remember that it's it's explained and it's explained, you know, in terms of the whole. Um, I'll go get it. I'll go get it out of the drawer and I look through. But it's also a reinforcement, I think. That's one. Yeah. But there's but, a, there's a ritualistic uh, oh meaning my gosh. to it. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to go grab my copy and I'll look it up. Okay. Let's see if I it's in the squares, squares, 15, 16. Okay. Here we go. This says squares attached to the four corners of a kesa and a priest's zagu cloth bowing mat are squares. And the Japanese word for these squares is kakujo. The squares symbolize the four guardian kings. The Japanese word for this is shintenno, shitenno of the cardinal points of the Buddhist universe who protect the Dharma from evil. Acolytes of Avalokiteshvara represented at the four sides of stupas. The bowing mat at the altar has these squares represented at the four corners. They are to be stepped around. Guardians of the four directions like Shenzhen of Chinese origin, protectors of Buddhist law and humankind, found standing at the corners of altars, said to live halfway down the four sides of Mount Chumisen or Sumeru or Mount Meru, the mythical home of Shakya Nyorai. Nyorai. Each leads an army of supernatural creatures to keep the fighting demons, Ashuras, at bay. Wow. That's great. So kind of um, the four directions and kind of protective. Protect the Dharma from evil. I'm looking at the Buddha's robe is sewn, and I'm thinking about just reading a piece of it. Mm. Yes, please. Yeah. This part that it's actually on page 10 of Sewing Buddha's Robe, and it's about practice of cultivating the empty field. We can discuss the robe as a thing, but the main merit of it is as a practice. It's actually when we practice, we wear a garment that's not made according to the dictates of fashion, but because it was passed down to us, warm hand to warm hand, generation to generation, from the time of the Buddha until now, that's the function of the clothing for us. And that's the spirit in which we accept and wear it. We have, we do have to treat these clothes with the utmost respect and treat them like the body of practice because 
that is what it is for us. Those were the words of Victoria Austin. Mm. The Buddha woke up in a farming village, put on the okesa, and went out to the village for takuhatsu, or begging for food. A rich farmer asks why the Buddha doesn't work if he, a rich man, still works. The Buddha answers, faith is a seed, practice is rain. Wisdom is my yoke and plow. Repentance, or having a sense of shame, is my plow bar. Aspiration is a rope to tie a yoke to an ox. And mindfulness is plow blade and digging bar. I behave myself prudently. I am discreet in speech. I eat moderately. Truth is my sickle to mow grass. Gentleness is untying the yoke from an ox when finished working. Diligence is my ox, which takes me to peacefulness or nirvana. I go forth without backsliding. Once I reach the peacefulness, I have no anxiety. My farming is done in this way. It brings about the results of a sweet dew. If you engage in this farming, you will be released from all kinds of suffering. Retold from the Sutta Nipata. It's from a lecture by Shahaku Okamura. The farmer became Buddha's disciple. Buddha's farming is a practice to become free from ego attachment and live in peacefulness. This is the meaning of working in a rice paddy. When we wear the okesa, we are also farming. This is the origin of the name Okesa, Fukuden A, our robe of virtuous field. This body and mind are the field we work on. It is not just a field of fortune from which we can expect to receive blessings without practice. We have to cultivate our life. These are the words of Shohaku Okomura from a lecture. Tozan asked a monk, what is most painful? The monk replied, to be in hell is most painful. Tozan said, no, it isn't. Then the monk asked, what do you think then is the most painful? Tozan replied, wearing the okesa, yet not having clarified the great matter is the most painful. One of the most famous sayings of Sawako Roshi is, wear the okesa and sit in Zazen. That's all. That's it. There's nothing else to search for. There's nowhere to go. Still, we look for something more valuable. We often find that we are still hungry ghosts in samsara, even though we are sitting in the zendo. Whenever we find that we are deviating from where we are now, we go right back to now, right here, by letting go. Shohaku Okamura. The reason Dogen refers to many kinds of robes is that the robe should be always with you. He puts emphasis to wear or to have the robe always with you, you know. It is not some special thing you wear, you know. 
that is wrong idea. It is something which you have always with you. Like the third patriarch in India's robe, he was born with the robe. So for him, it is not possible to take it off. His skin is already robe. Those are the most important points when you want to have proper understanding of Okesa. Shinryu Suzuki Roshi. In this lineage, you sew a rakasu. Don't put your rakasu on and start wearing it right away, but give it to the teacher to give it to you. And at that time, you recite the chant below three times from the Kesa receiving ceremony or first to your sewing teacher. So although we sew the rakasu, it is not ours until it is given to us. This process recognizes our interconnection, the importance of having a teaching, a group and a teacher to practice with. We don't go off by ourselves to get enlightened. We practice with all beings for the benefit of all beings. Pat Phelan. The Jukai ceremony is also called Bodhisattva initiation. The word Jukai is Japanese and it is written with two characters. The second character, Kai, refers to the precepts, and the first character, ju, means to give and to receive. Jukai is the ceremony of giving and receiving the precepts. In Zen, we use the 16 bodhisattva precepts, which are given both in priest, leaving home, and lay, staying home ordination ceremonies. Pat Phelan. People wish for the guidance of the precepts in their life. Instead of expressing this directly, they may ask to sew a rakasu. The finite process of sewing may seem less intimidating, though still challenging for many. Yet, asking to sew is not synonymous with asking permission to receive the precepts. Tensham Reb Anderson tells us, when you actually ask, may I receive the precepts, you touch something very deep in yourself. In the Bodhisattva initiation ceremony, we begin by invoking the presence of all great and enlightened beings. We invite them to sustain and support us as we enter Buddha's way. We open our hearts and minds to their wisdom and compassion. We do not say the Bodhisattva vow explicitly, yet it forms the background for receiving the 16 great bodhisattva precepts. Tension Rep. Anderson. The bodhisattva vows, beings are numberless, I vow to awaken with them. Delusions are inexhaustible, I vow to end them. Dharma gates are boundless. I vow to enter them. Buddha's way is unsurpassable. I vow to become it. The three refuges. I take refuge in Buddha. I take refuge in Dharma. I take refuge in Sangha. The three pure precepts. I vow to refrain from all evil. I vow to do all that is good. 
I vow to live and be lived for the benefit of all beings. The 10 clear mind precepts. I resolve not to kill, but to cherish all life. Two, I resolve not to steal, but to honor the gift not yet given. Three, I resolve not to misuse sexuality, but to remain faithful in relationships. Four, I resolve not to lie, but to communicate the truth. Five, I resolve not to sell or use the wine and drugs of delusion, but to polish clarity. Six, I resolve not to dwell on the mistakes of others, but to create wisdom from ignorance. Seven, I resolve not to praise myself and downgrade others, but to maintain modesty, putting others first. Eight, I resolve not to withhold spiritual or material aid, but to share understanding, giving freely of self. Nine, I resolve not to harbor ill will, but to dwell in equanimity. Ten, I resolve not to abuse the three treasures in respecting the Buddha, unfolding the Dharma, and nourishing the Sangha. This is from the Berkeley Zen Center Liturgy. The real meaning of precepts is not just rules. It is rather our way of life. How you keep the precepts is how you organize your life. And how you organize your life is how we practice Zazen. Zazen practice is precepts. One of the precepts and all of the precepts. Suzuki Roshi. Ordination. What is a formless field of benefaction? Tasahara, our practice place, is a formless field of benefaction. Coming here and coming together and doing this practice brings up a quality of liberation that's not exactly about being in a forest or being in a village or being with nice, friendly people. Long, long ago, when the Buddha was teaching, it was this quality that brought many people to him, to study, to follow him. His ordination was not complicated. People would come to him, and he would say, Come, monk. Come, monk. And that would be the first time that they would be called a monk. And then they would come. And that was their ordination. They decided to follow the Buddha's teachings because the teaching had something to do with noticing the part of life that everybody notices but doesn't really want to notice and actually addressing that. One story about this is that during the time of the Buddha in the social system, there were various social strata that people could be in. If a person of one of the higher castes was there and the shadow of an untouchable person crossed their water, they couldn't drink it without elaborate rituals of purification where the shadow touched them. One time the Buddha and other monks were down at the edge of the water and Buddha expressed his intention to go into the water. Then from the bushes came a voice saying, no, don't go down there. I've been down there. I'm hiding in this bush so that my shadow won't pollute you. The Buddha said, please come out. He asked the man about the lake, and then he went down and drank from the lake. 
Then the man said, aren't you scared of getting polluted? The Buddha responded, no, a real Brahmin. And the Brahmins were lawgivers and holders of the culture. A real Brahmin is one who looks at suffering and addresses that problem through practice. One who pays attention to life and one who helps people. And the man was so moved that he started to cry. And he said, you mean anybody? And the Buddha said, yes, for instance, you. Buddha invited the man to join his order, saying, come, monk. This was totally different from the thinking of the time. Not only did the Buddha notice something that most people just accepted, as the way things were, but he thoroughly addressed the suffering in that situation in a very natural way. It was this quality of the Buddha's cultivating a formless field of benefaction, any place the Buddha went, that encouraged people of all walks of life to follow the Buddha and study his teachings. It's a really sweet picture of lay ordination at the Berkeley Zen Center. It's passing the papers of ordination to a lay ordination to a recipient of that, the teacher passing this over. And those are papers that the teacher creates themselves that draws all the characters and writes all the names. Very time consuming process. Anne, um, can I check something with you? Yes. yes. I have um, pinned my frame. Mm hmm. Yes. Um, and I'm just doing the running stitch, which it says is two two millimeters. Uh, I'm I'm assuming it's above the uh, yes where, where, where you've pinned. Um, is there any um guidance for size of stitches or uh, how how neatly you have to do? <laughs> um, I don't um, no, the stitches should be neat, but I would say, you know, uh, not exactly basting stitches, but uh, a little bit smaller than what I consider basting stitches. And I guess I consider Let's see, basting stitches to be maybe a quarter of an inch or let's, we'll go to centimeters. So the length of a basting stitch to me is about one centimeter. And the length of these stitches, the running stitch, I would say, are a little bit less than half a centimeter. Great. Maybe like three or four millimeters. Great. Great. That's helpful. Thank you. Good. And the bit where you come to the point of the triangle, mm -hmm. where it just says do a... I mean, what I've done is kind of stitched up one side and then just done a loose stitch across and then down the other side. Is that right? Exactly. That's exactly right. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thought it might be helpful for other people perhaps to see as well what the pinning. I yes, I, absolutely. I if you can show that. I don't know that I can show that. Um, because I don't think, I think that's an instruction that's not that clear. <laughs> it, 
in the exactly. in the inst in the instructions. So the pinning is with the right sides together, um, and you kind of pin up the the triangle that you've created, and then you're doing the same in each each. So you make sort of four corners, really. If you can see that it looks, you begin to see how the frame begins to form. So the pinning is the same in each. So when you've done a cross, you put in the 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 uh, edges of the cross together to make the triangle again. With the, because you put the right sides together. I don't know whether that's clear. So it kind of makes this this curious <laughs> frame that you're then going to start folding once you've stitched it. Yeah, that's so helpful. Yeah, really helpful. Thank you. You're welcome. I'm hoping I've got it right. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I think you've got it just right. Yeah. We've got five minutes left. I think I'm going to read something from the chant book for these last few minutes. So this is one of the chants that I really love. It's the song of the grass roof grass roof hermitage, I think. You get the chat book. So this is a really beautiful poem. We did a, um, a practice period studying this poem a few years ago. And it's the song of the grass roof, grass roof hermitage by Sekito Kisen. I built a grass hut where there's nothing of value. After eating, I relax and enjoy a nap. When it was completed, fresh weeds appeared. Now it's been lived in, covered by weeds. The person in the hut lives here calmly, not stuck to inside, outside, or in between. Places worldly people live, he doesn't live. Realms worldly people love, he doesn't love. Though the hut is small, that includes the entire world. In 10 feet square, an old man illumines forms and their nature. A Mahayana Bodhisattva trusts without doubt. The middling or lowly can't help wondering, will this hut perish or not? Perishable or not, the original master is present. Not dwelling south or north east or west, firmly based on steadiness. It can't be surpassed. A shining window below the green pines. Jade palaces or vermilion towers can't compare with it. Just sitting with head covered, all things are at rest. Thus, this mountain monk doesn't understand at all. Living here, he no longer works to get free. Who would proudly arrange seats trying to entice guests? Turn around the light to shine within, then just return. The vast, inconceivable source can't be faced or turned away from. Meet the ancestral teachers. Be familiar with their instructions. Find grasses to build a hut and don't give up. Let go of hundreds of years and relax completely. Open your hands and walk innocent. Thousands of words, myriad interpretations are only to free you from obstructions. If you want to know the undying person in the hut, don't separate from this skin bag here and now. So I'm going to call the others back in and start packing up and we'll bow out.
Thank you, Anne. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. It's time, everyone. Thank you. Bye, you too. Bye. See you all soon. Happy sewing. Happy sewing. <laughs>